You're listening to The Fat Cast, live from the studio with Colin Reynolds. Good afternoon, you're watching the Fat Cast. Uh, my name is Colin Reynolds and uh, I'm the host of this uh, show. And my guest today is uh, my good friend, uh, Dan Salzberger. How are you doing, Dan? Great, great pronunciation too, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Hey, Usually I um, just uh, shortcut, I just say Schultzy because it's easier to remember. I quite me. like that myself. <laughs> and I get Silzy, Salzy, Saltzy, yep. every vowel, pick a vowel. Like the way I imagine like nicknames is if you're playing football, yep, and like someone's like you're looking for someone, you be like, oh, Schultze, you know, like that's <laughs> that's the nickname. Yep. If, if you can yell it on a football field, it works. It's like a bunch of penguins, and you know the mother penguin can hear her penguin over the other five thousand penguins. Right, right, mm. indeed, indeed. Now, um, the the piece you just played for us, yep, uh, I was getting um. It's funny, I was just about to use the word vibes, but the, there's a song that features a vibraphone, actually. <laughs> it reminded me of just a, a little. In the style of um, uh, toss salad and scrambled eggs. Oh, yeah. You know, the Frasier theme. Yeah, yeah. That's it a had, great little jazz tune. Yeah, yeah, it felt like to me it had like a similar kind of energy to it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's the little tune that I wrote when I was living overseas. I was living in China and... I, I gave it a Chinese title, it was, and I'm not going to pronounce it because my pronunciation's shocking, but um, it was called Four Things. Four Things. Yeah, I wrote yeah. quite a few tunes when I was over overseas, and um, I had a fair, fair bit of time. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, look, it's really just a McCoy Tyner kind of a vibe, you know what I mean? Like, so you spent some time in China? Yeah, lived over there for three years. Wow. Yeah. Um, what can you tell me about the, the, the jazz scene there? Well, where I was in Guangzhou, the, the jazz scene. Canton. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Very good, yeah. So southern China, we have Beijing, Shanghai and Guangzhou down south, you know, near Hong Kong and um, Macau. Yep. Um, in Shanghai there's a, and Beijing also, there was a massive, you know, pretty big jazz scene back in, you know, even just a few years ago since the crackdowns and 
tension in the world, of less course. so. But um, yeah, Shanghai and Beijing had lots of expats, lots of Americans, and you know people from all over the world, and, and lots of great local players that have been to you know great schools, Juilliard and Manhattan, then come back to um, China, and yeah, so there's some really quality players and. There was a lot of gigs over there. And, sure. But where I was in Canton, it was quite small, um, especially when I was there. There was, you know, like 10 dudes um, that I worked with and that I knew that played jazz in Guangzhou. Tell me a little something about the venues. What are the, the venues like there? Well, I haven't – like there was a Jay-Z's club in Guangzhou. Yep. And there's a Jay-Z's in Shanghai and there's a Jay-Z in Chengdu, I so think. So this is like a franchise Yeah, it's a franchise sort of club. a jazz club. Yeah, and they were really cool fit-outs. And like, is this like a like a bar environment, restaurant yeah, environment? Yeah, both sort of big, big places, fancy, high-end. Sure. Um, kind of thing. Mezzanine floors. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the one. us with white coats. That sort of thing. It really <laughs> was. It was a real scene. Um, but I, I was really fortunate to play in this great club called Hope and Sesame in Guangzhou, mm. which is a speakeasy bar run by this Swiss guy called Bastion. Does that and mean there's gambling that goes on in the back? No, it doesn't, but it means you can't because gambling, sorry, I've got to say that straight away is illegal in China. You can, you've got to go over to Macau for that. Um, yeah. But no, definitely no gambling at Hope and Sesame, but the, an award-winning cocktail bar yep. and amazing. There was lineups and a part of the, the part of Bastion's um, philosophy was to have jazz and you had this tiny little jazz room, not too much bigger than this with a piano and a tiny stage and some seats and he'd be serving these amazing molecular cocktails that he'd come up with and we'd be playing jazz and we were part of part of the whole experience and I had a regular gig there and could have been working there many nights a week. They looked after me and, yeah, had a sure. wonderful time. Yep. No, that's mm. it. That's, that sounds pretty great. Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, how musicians are, are treated, mm-hmm. um, it, I mean, is it the same kind of thing as here where you're sort of – you're not necessarily looked down on as such, but mm-hmm. you certainly belong to a separate strata of society as a musician, as opposed to yeah. other working professionals, say doctors, yeah. lawyers, builders, architects, whatever else. Like China, mm-hmm. uh, I guess. I guess it's it's culturally. I suppose. I know what you're saying, and and jazz in in a lot of um, social circles can be seen to be the upper class, you know. So in a lot of fancy places. You often have, and we get employed as jazz musicians to play in some of these lovely kind of venues and that kind of scene. For sure, okay. As well as you know, so so jazz, so jazz is it, it, there's certainly a stigma or status attached. Yes, um, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Which in, in in a certain cool sense, for us. in a certain sense, is not dissimilar to the West either. I mean, uh, fancy restaurants, maybe they've got some classical, but. If not, then they've probably got jazz. That's right, yep. which, which is a great thing. It really is classy music and it's a great art form. That... Now, you, you play piano for us today, but you play mm-hmm. some other instruments too. Yeah, I try to. Um, so uh, tell us about those. Well, I, you know, like I've always played music since a kid. You know, I played recorder. As, that was the first instrument I played and I was really into it. Yeah, like, wow. Like really into it. Yep. And um, me and my mate... We, we wanted to be better than our music teacher in grade four and five and 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 we pretty we caught him up pretty quickly with our recorder skills. Sure. Um, yeah, and then the saxophone obviously is really easy to finger after you've played a recorder, it's essentially the same thing, or woodwind instruments, whether they, you know, read it or not, they're essentially, you know, the same. So, yeah, that's where I started. And sure. Yeah, and I always played. I had piano lessons as a kid with a beautiful um, nun in Launceston. She was 94 years of age. Mm. She had polio when she was in her 30s. Her name was Sister Ursula. Um, She was incredible. I don't know how she even taught me because she couldn't hold her head up. She had had to hold prop her arm up like this and she'd pop it up on the piano lid. (laughs) And she'd breathe really heavily and... Say, you know, I'd play a country gardens and she loved that particular piece and she'd fall asleep and her arm would slip off the side of the piano <laughs> lid and her head would bob down oh, and dear. she'd bang her elbow on some notes and I'd be very apologetic and 
she was she was really really lovely i skipped a lesson one day and she walked to the other side of the school in her 90s which took her over half an hour well, so yeah. over my lesson i walked it back that took another probably 40 minutes because it was uphill and she sent all these other students away and gave me my piano lesson <laughs> i still feel bad about that i, I never missed another lesson after that so you've been playing, obviously, yeah, so a very, yep. very long time now. Yeah, yeah I love music. Now, um, so uh, another band I've seen you play with, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, Boiler. Not not Boiler. I I um. Were you not playing with Boiler up at the Salty Dog? I did sit in with Boiler up at the yes. Salty Dog. Yes. And we'll have, I have a beautiful ties with Boiler up. Um, mm. The original custodian of Boiler up was um, the late Joe Pirere, and Joe was a dear friend of mine and... Um, he did ask me to be in Foil Up many years ago, but I was already playing in a in another reggae outfit that I used to run called Lively Up, so I I declined. Sure. <laughs> and um, Joe was cool, but Joe played um, not guitar. He was a guitarist, but he played electric bass sure. in Lively Up that I used to uh, manage. So yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful guy, wonderful musician, and huge. Huge musicality. Recently, and you, fingers. you've been playing with Danny. Yes. In, in his yeah, project. very lucky to be playing with, you know, some really quality musicians. Danny um, writing wonderful songs and playing all those instruments like he does, but also, you know, the rhythm section, Tom Robb and Hamish. Absolutely. And Jed Adams. And, you know, it's very lucky to be it's the stacked lineup all around. Really. Yeah, look, Hobart has a great jazz scene it really does for it per capita um man how many good players are there here you know how many good oh, absolutely. piano players how many good dramas how you know like it just goes on it's it's awesome we punch above our weight <laughs> <laughs> we certainly do and it's um i mean obviously it has a lot to do with the museum as well but uh there's kind of like you know like a constant venue for jazz. oh mate how good is it you know like it's a dream gig for some people um I've been very lucky. I only live a couple of minutes from Mona and play there regularly. And, you know, it's it's really improved the whole scene, though. Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, other cities, um, you know, they tend to have, like, maybe their jazz clubs. And mm-hmm. we're perhaps sorely lacking that in the last couple of years. I agree. A lot I, of venue closures. I agree. And we used to have a lovely little jazz designated jazz club, Temple Place in I remember town. Temple Place. And it was one of the reasons. So it was a cigar lounge. Exactly. Remember when you could yeah, smoke man, in there? I know. I was <laughs> having same, a cigar same. And, a, and a single malt. Back in the day, Express Train used to play yep. Tim Partridge, yes. Al Dobson. I used to play with Tim in, well, those, in those bands. I played a lot with Tim um, uh, and a lot of people at Temple Place. And Tom Anderson, the late Tom Anderson, mm. was the owner. And he was an amazing guy. He, he, his first gig was at Ronnie Scott's as a cleaner, which is the jazz club, biggest jazz club in London, yep. just because he loved jazz so much. He was from Denmark, I think, or Copenhagen. But he was a massive jazz lover and that's why he had Temple Place. He he was friends with Ella Fitzgerald. He used mm. to look after Ella and Dizzy and all the people that wow. used to come to Copenhagen. And I used to smoke cigars and drink single malts and hear these amazing stories, how he actually went out with Ella on dinners and wow. stuff. It was really cool. Now, Temple Place. A couple of years before Temple Place. Yeah. Nonies. Before my Hobart time. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. So that was in the mall, downstairs, cafe. I've heard of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Only someone was like, last night was talking about well, it. Fred Bradshaw was talking oh, about Fred. it. Oh, Fred. Yeah, yes. so I, was, I did a gig with Sir Frederick Bradshaw last night. The you know, the, Sir Frederick Bradshaw. That's what we call yeah. him. We've knighted him. <laughs> he definitely sharpest, deserved a knight. Sharpest dress man in the He's the room. greatest guy of all time. Seriously, what a saxophone player. Oh, right? yeah. And, uh, it, and drummer. Oh, and drummer, exactly. He's like, so oh, yeah, I was, I've musician. never played drums before, but fine, I'll just be the main he drummer swings. of this band. He swings like a rusty gate. He just gets it. He, you can, know use, I mean? he can use brushes, just brushes on a snare and yeah. get that kick sound. Yeah. With, with, uh. Yeah, he's got that hi-hat snapping right on the front of the beat, you know, like he's thought about it. He's been in the scene for a long time. Yeah. He's wise and he, he knows what swings and that's what I love about him. He's the rule. He's a real groover. Yeah, classic. He can, he can seriously. He was burning last night. I've seen him playing stuff that I've never heard him play before. You know, he surprises me all the time. What a guy! Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, Man, so, if, 
I had uh, Aaron here not, not that long ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. He's, so Fred calls me his first love child. Yes. And Aaron is his second love child. <laughs> he's obviously he's a bit younger than me. So, yeah, Aaron and I have a great rapport and, um, and we both dearly love Sir Frederick Badger. <laughs> Absolutely. So you, ultimately you're essentially a bit of a session player, really. Like you kind of, all of the different mm-hmm. sort of projects you're involved in. Yeah. So the um, you know, the South Side Steppers, yep. that's uh, your, um, what do you call that, marching band? Yeah, it's a second line um, lineup. So in New Orleans when they do the Mardi Gras, this is the kind of stuff you'll hear. It's Mardi Gras, New Orleans, you know, sort of, yeah, bass drum, snare drum, sousaphone. But we do lots of our own Tassie take. And because we're boys of the, you know, I was born in 1978 and we listened to a lot of hip-hop, there's a lot of funk and there's a lot of hip-hop and there's a lot of soul and For sure. stuff involved as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool project and we've been doing some really cool gigs and... Yeah, so I, I write some tunes for that and the trombone player Andre Lobanov and Tim Jones and we all contribute, you know. It's Tim a real... Jones, yes. Yeah. You know, what a lovely bloke. Oh, mate, Jones. <laughs> <laughs> no, amazing that, I, you know, he can bring his TSO tuba skills into a, a second line band like he does and, and he's playing sousaphone so he's switched, you know, he's turned to the dark side almost. Wow. And I, I, I don't think I've seen Tim play the sousaphone. Oh, no, no, I have, I have. I have. I was just about to say, there's only one other sousaphone player I even know. Yeah, Ollie Platt. Ollie Platt. Yeah. And and there's Hayden Dare, who used to live in Tassie. He's an army um, army band guy. I, I remember t- years ago when we were playing reggae music at the Queen's Head back in the day. Um, I said, "You've got to, you've got to play sousaphone. Such a great <laughs> instrument. And you've got the chops for it for sure." And he took to it like a, you know, but amazing. If He's, you could just yeah. keep the psychology, like. It's a bass. It's still a yeah, bass. Exactly you what know? it is. It's a bass. It's the original bass almost. I don't know if you know an upright bass came first, but they've definitely, you know. It, funnily enough, in Australia they kind of never really took off like they do. You know, like you look at American music and you look at all that marching stuff and sousas are everywhere. I, I think this may have something to do with uh veering off course wildly now, but like the militarization yeah. of America. Yeah, and that particular... It was like brass, you know. Yeah. But how... If you've listened to some of that stuff, like there's some of those schools over there just sound incredible. Oh. Okay. The Blue Devils, you know, like... Certainly. Yeah, it's a, it's a real, um, you know, educational process. And, you know, I, I feel like I kind of would have loved to have gone through something like that. I'm not sure... If I would have, but looking at it from far, it looks like a great tradition. Those snare drum players learn oh, such absolutely. incredible chops and actually, it's such a it. discipline and they dance and uh, memorise all those tunes. Oh, and it's a, certainly. Mm. Yeah, no, there's no charts. Like, oh, sometimes you say, <laughs> you, like someone's got their, their woodwind or whatever, a clarinet. And like the chart, like on the end. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can't remember what they call them, yeah. Yeah. All the old saxophones and, yeah. and flutes and um, instruments have a little attachment at the back yeah, that you can like, plug in. No, your... just spend the time, <laughs> learn the chart. Yeah. <laughs> Quite often, and you're better off doing that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. For some, re- for some reason, it made me think of that movie, Mr. Holland's Opus. Did you ever see I that? I don't remember it. I oh, remember the title. a school teacher in the US. But did he save them, save the world? Oh well, no. Well, see, this is the thing. This is the thing. Like, I mean, he obviously had an amazing musical talent, you know, musical professor, etc. Mm-hmm. And just to spoiler alert, cut the whole thing short. Basically, his whole life he wanted to do something great with his music. Always wanted to write some great symphony, or mm-hmm. and he ended up one thing after another. He couldn't move, and he ended up basically just being a school teacher his his mm-hmm. whole life. But then kind of the the end of the movie, like all of his old students for like like a selection of students for the last like 30 or 40 years he's been teaching have come in, formed an orchestra and played his unfinished symphony oh, for lovely. him. So it was just like this real emotional yep. emotional movie. And uh, there are just like uh, there there are a lot of scenes like with those marching bands and the mm. and the, and the it's brasses. a great it just, it just reminded me of yeah that. <laughs> and look I was I was a 
taught music for a long time. I've just changed career recently, but um, it's 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 a great part of being a musician, being able to impart, you know, what you know to younger people or older people. You know, I've taught a lot of older students and continue to. But um, when I was a kid and I used to go to St Helens Jazz Festival and back in 1993, they were always like Ian Pearce and I, I'm, I was so lucky. Tom Baker, I, I could go on and on, Alex Hutchinson, all the local guys, Christine Bailey. It was amazing and, and, the, and the old guys, had, I shouldn't really say that, but the, the musicians at the gig would always be taking me out in the back room and saying, you've got to know this song, how, you know, and showing me stuff. Sure. And, yeah, and it was that's part of part of our job is to to do the same thing. And music cuts through all generations. Like I do gigs with Fred Bradshaw; he's eighty two. Yep. Um, I do you know gigs with kids as well, and um, and young young people players. Lin- Lindsay's about the same age too. Isn't Lindsay's he? very exactly the same age. Actually, I got a text today or yesterday about doing a gig at Lindsay with Lindsay at Mona, but I'm working. Ah, indeed. <laughs> I said if we can do, we can do it later on, but yeah, but um, yeah, we're really lucky here in Tassie, and um, well, that's it. You, you're actually doing it. You're involved in a pretty special project at the moment. I don't know um, how much you were allowed to talk about that or not. Uh, what can you mention about can... 1958? Uh, ah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well there's a an amazing world class studio being built. I'm not sure if this is public knowledge. I don't, I don't know. I definitely haven't. <laughs> I haven't signed, I, any, I, I don't I haven't even signed know, anything like, saying I can't talk about it. No, that's it. it that's it. No yeah, no, I don't anything. know if it's a secret thing or yeah. not, which is why I haven't said anything. Yeah, yet. so the, the studio that um, the Lane Group and Agris and a whole bunch of other um, companies are, are building for Mona, mm. um, they've purchased the Abbey Road mixing desk. Yep. B is it B two? Uh, it's got a. I don't know what the like name B2 of it is. B two or something strange like R two D two. But I'm not sure exactly it's, what. Yeah, for the preamps ultimately. Yeah, and it's some old space age looking. You know, it was in Studio B in Abbey Road, and it's a very historic piece of yeah. musical technology. That is. Yeah, and um, look, Chris is going to be manning Chris Townend. Yes, going to be manning the fort, and, and it's going to be incredible. It really is. Um, and it's a it's a fully modern studio. Yes, it just happens to feature some of this uh, vintage, beautiful vintage uh, technology. Yeah, mm, yeah, best of both worlds. Very excited to see what projects. I mean, what uh, you know, musical projects come out. Yeah, of yeah. I think they've they've been booking lots of stuff in already, and I think yeah, I think they've got like a big long list of people. <laughs> yeah. that's all, and all the dates are booked like TBC, TBC, <laughs> TBC, TBC. <laughs> which yeah. you kind of have to do, obviously, because. Yeah. You know, these things take time. That's right. And there's all sorts of unforeseen curveballs, mm-hmm. last-minute curveballs. Curve balls. That's interesting you say that because all the walls are raked and, you know, curved and you know, there's not a straight surface almost in the place. So. Indeed, for the sake of obviously wicking the reverb away. Yeah, and it's actually following the existing shape of the um, the existing building. Oh, I see. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, no, that definitely sounds, uh, sounds great and obviously myself and the rest of the music community are pretty excited to see yep. what that yeah you know, me turns too up. it's going to be fabulous and the c7 grand piano is going to be sitting oh yeah there. Mm. Mm. well very yummy that's probably all the time i've got today yeah no worries thank you very much for coming oh, my on pleasure. Dan. and um we'll um well, what do you got coming up gigs Lots of gigs Friday, every Friday with Danny. Yep. From four to five at Mona. Yep. Um, I've, Tuesday fortnights with Freddie Bradshaw. Yep. Um, Sir Frederick Bradshaw Trio Sir at, Frederick. The, at the Duke. Yep. Um, yeah, come along and see Fred. He's playing. He's he's eighty two or eighty three, and he's playing exceptionally good. It's so cool. Um, and I'm doing a lot of Southside. And what does he play in that brand? He plays his alto saxophone. What he Excellent. his main thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, that's. I'm probably forgetting things. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so Keep cool. an eye out, Dan Sulzberger. <laughs> Thanks, Jeez. and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, dudes. Thanks, Matt.